I would like to welcome you to the Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this is the second one that we've had in 2018. Uh, as many of you know, this series is designed to bring uh, some of the nation's leading and most thought uh, provocative leaders from various disciplines and professional fields to the university. Uh, exposing our university community to a broad range of views, a broad range of perspectives and angles on the myriad of opportunities and challenges we face as a nation is in keeping with Morgan's mission of serving as a premier public urban research university rooted in our great HBCU tradition. This series is designed to promote what we call here at Morgan, mind expansion. It is designed to enable us as a university community, or particularly our students, to wrestle with the ideas and issues of the past, uh, the challenges of the present, and of course, to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow. A college experience is supposed to enable one to develop the tools and the skills to think critically and to challenge common thinking. This is really at the core what this Presidential Distinguished Speaker Series represents. In this series, we seek out individuals who are on the cutting edge of thought, who embrace innovation, and who espouse bold ideas. We seek individuals who have the ability to see around corners, and individuals who are able to imagine an America that is inclusive, an America that is equitable, an America that is just, and an America that is fair to all. And so in so doing, uh, we are showing our students and our entire community what it really means when we say here at Morgan that we are growing the future and leading the world. You know, the tradition of fighting for inclusion, inclusion and fighting for what's right is not new to Morgan. It was at Morgan that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. first shared major aspects of his I Have a Dream speech before he delivered it at the Washington Monument. It was at Morgan that the first college sit-in movement occurred which led to the integration of shops and restaurants here in Baltimore City. We here at Morgan value free expression of ideas and thoughts, and we always remain open to diverse speakers. As president, I certainly understand the importance of our students being exposed to multifaceted points of view, for such views often lead to greatness in thought and greatness and possibilities. And so with that said, uh, I am extremely honored and happy uh, to have all of you join us this evening and to have with us the Honorable Loretta Lynch. <laughs> Attorney General Lynch is one of the most highly accomplished public figures in America today, uh, former U.S. Attorney General. Uh, she, of course, uh, is a leading progressive voice during her highly distinguished career, which spans more than 30 years. Uh, she was the first female African American to serve as Attorney General of the United States, appointed by former President Barack Obama in 2015. She also served as the head of the U.S. Attorney General's Office for the Eastern District of New York twice under both President Obama and President Clinton. Described by President Obama as, quote, the only lawyer in America who battles mobsters, drug lords, and terrorists, and still has the reputation for being a charming people person, he said. <laughs> Uh, she has been instrumental in shaping the direction of the nation on a number of tough issues. She improved the relationship between local law enforcement and the communities they serve, and she has taken bold stances on criminal justice reform. 
Attorney General Lynch has spent years in the trenches, rising through the ranks as a prosecutor, aggressively fighting terrorism, financial fraud, and cybercrime, all while vigorously defending civil and human rights. She was born in North Carolina, uh, the daughter of a school librarian and a fourth generation Baptist minister. Uh, she was also inspired by stories about her grandfather, who, like my father, was a sharecropper in the 1930s, who helped to shape members of his community and who had no other recourse, as I know very well growing up in segregated Alabama under Jim Crow. Attorney General Lynch earned her BA in English and American Lit from Harvard College in 1981 and a JD from Harvard Law School in 1984. Ladies and gentlemen of the university community, please join me in giving a warm Morgan welcome to the Honorable Loretta Lynch. Good evening, everyone. Oh, wait, this is Morgan State. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. That's the Morgan I know. That's the Morgan I know. President Wilson, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And let me thank you, your staff, and everyone for the warm welcome that I've received since I came on this campus. I'm privileged to be here with my husband, Steve Hargrove, who's here in the front row. He came over with me. Thank you also for your leadership of this great university. I am driving through just seeing the change and the growth. It reinforces the dynamism and the spirit that really is Morgan. You're not just Maryland's preeminent public urban research institution. You are also a place with a strong sense of history and a strong connection to the present day community. Morgan's work in supporting undergraduate and graduate students, as well as its outstanding role as an incubator for Fulbright and Rhodes Scholars, is well known and exemplary. Now, all that is public. I am personally quite proud of my own connections to Morgan. One of my dearest cousins is, a, is an alum here, class of 1980. He'll be very unhappy when I gave that year. Uh, but I was also tremendously honored when the choir from this great university, Morgan State University Choir, performed and sang the national anthem at my formal investiture in Washington, D.C. in June of 2015. People are still talking about how they represented you and all of us so, so well. Now, I'm also delighted to be back here in Baltimore, a great and historic city. I know that Morgan's connection to Baltimore is very, very deep, but Baltimore actually has a very special meaning for me. For me, it served as a bookend, it was the beginning and the end of my tenure as Attorney General. I came to Baltimore to deal with the issues of police and community relations here. Baltimore also became one of an additional series of inspirations for one of my top priorities as Attorney General, I had already decided that one of the things I most wanted to work on was improving the relationship between law enforcement and the communities that we served. And I am here to tell you that that is work that is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. Now, I was confirmed as Attorney General in April of 2015. My first day in office was the day of Freddie Gray's funeral here in this great city. And I, along with the nation, watched as the peaceful protests after the funeral devolved into violence, with injuries to both civilians and police and widespread devastation to portions of this great city. Now, both Mr. Gray's death and those ensuing protests definitely shone a light on Baltimore. You all were here. You felt it. You saw it. I know you remember that feeling of helplessness as we watched. And it was the same light that had shown on Ferguson, Missouri just a year before. Now from those who viewed the protests and even Mr. Gray's death in isolation as events that were limited in time and space and causation to the spring of 2015, we heard the inevitable questions. 
Why did Baltimore devolve into violence? Especially when Mr. Gray's family, like Mr. Brown's, had called for peaceful expressions. Why did Baltimore devolve into looting? Why was there burning? And as I watched both the actions and the inevitable reactions, what came to mind for me most was Martin Luther King's prescient statement, a riot is the language of the unheard. A riot is the language of the unheard. And then King also asked the question, not just of his time, not just of our time, but the question of the history of race in America. What is it that America has failed to hear? What is it that America has failed to hear? And in fact, my first trip as Attorney General was here to Baltimore one week after those events. I met with young people, members of the community, and talked with them, and they were frustrated by long-standing issues with the police department. They shared stories with me that went back for years. And it was clear that the intergenerational force of this trauma was real, was in fact a real thing. I met city leaders who were searching for solutions and trying to balance their need to respond to their citizens and control the situation with the very real need for federal help. But I also met with police officers who had worked 16-hour shifts for days in a row through the unrest, some of whom had been injured themselves, all of whom were working to preserve the peace. Different groups, very different views of both the root and the immediate causes of not just the violence, but the underlying strains. And at the end of my conversation with everyone I met, I heard the same thing. I heard the same language. I do this, I protest. I do this, I lead this city. I do this, I protect this city. I do this because I love this city and I wanna make it better. Now this raised the question, with so many disparate groups all feeling committed to and connected with the city, and yet clearly so far apart. How had Baltimore ended up where Ferguson had been? And what was it that Baltimore had failed to hear? Now when King raised this question in the late 60s, he also answered it. In 1967, when he first gave this interview, he said, America has failed to hear that the economic plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. He saw, as so many of us working on these issues have seen, that deep-rooted economic inequality leads to inequality in, frankly, every other aspect of life. Every single aspect of life. It leads to feelings of disconnect between citizens and their government, including law enforcement. Now, in the weeks, those spring days of 2015, the weeks after Freddie Gray's funeral, the Obama administration convened a whole-of-government approach to Baltimore to assess the issues beyond policing that had led to such disillusion and distress. And not surprisingly, in addition to my agency, the Department of Justice, the agencies that were deeply involved were the Department of Labor, who focused on the dearth of economic opportunity in one of our greatest cities, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which focused on the problems with affordable or even any housing for so many Baltimore residents. But to show you the intersectionality of all these issues, an equally important voice at the table, which I will tell you even I had not considered, was the Department of Transportation, which talked to us about the inaccessibility the inaccessibility of many of Baltimore's poorest and most challenged neighborhoods to the portions of the city which had resources and jobs. The literal inability to get across town can confine someone, can limit someone, can make their world smaller. Inequality, leading to inequality in all aspects of life. And viewed in that context, I have to tell you, I could see how the flashpoint event of Freddie Gray's death had unleashed a wellspring of frustration that led to violence. And the question that people asked as well, might, might as well not have been why the violence, 
but how had this city avoided this earlier? How had this city avoided falling into this violence earlier? And just as Baltimore evo evoked memories of Ferguson for me, so did Ferguson, Missouri provide another example of long-standing issues and frustrations coming to a boil over the flashpoint killing of young Michael Brown by Officer Wilson of the Ferguson Police Department. You all remember those days too. You saw the same things I did too. You saw peaceful protests turn to violence, but you also saw law enforcement officers roll tanks down the street of an American city and point them at children. You saw that too. So when the smoke there died, the Department of Justice was called in and we investigated not just the shooting, but the circumstances around it. And while we weren't able to build a criminal case there, the investigation that we conducted into the structure of policing in Ferguson, as well as, as well as the municipal system of economic inequality, placed the lack of trust between the minority community and not just the police department, but the entire structure of Ferguson city government into stark relief. When we stepped back from that flashpoint issue and examined the layers of inequality, we could see it. Now our investigation certainly revealed a police department in Ferguson that had engaged in unconscionable violations of citizens' constitutional rights. And we brought that case and were able to reach a consent decree with them. But we also found a city government that through an oppressive system of fees and fines and tickets was taxing its poorest and minority residents in exorbitant ways to fund itself. And when you combined this with the poorly trained police department that engaged in abusive policing when interacting with the minority community but not with other members of the community, you had a situation where the poorest were being taxed to fund government services and protection for the wealthiest. Inequality, leading out to, to inequality in all aspects of life. It was an, am an amazing report and it opened my eyes to this issue as well and that became something that I focused on as Attorney General. But we saw steep fines imposed for minor offenses Again, prim primarily directed at the minority residents of Ferguson's. One example was a fine of over $300 for jaywalking. <laughs> jaywalking. And I will tell you, I lived in New York a lot of years. As many times as I cut across the street, <laughs> had there been a fine, <laughs> I would not be here today. We also saw a fine of over $500 for untended lawns. Untended lawns. Now, I know you should cut your grass, but $500. But not just the fines, but the punishment was extreme as well. And in one particularly egregious example, there was an African-American member of the community, a woman. She received two traffic tickets in the year 2007. Two traffic tickets. Could happen to anybody. These two traffic tickets totaled $152. Not a lot but everyone can't come up with that sometimes at the end of the month. You know, when you're trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, $152 is not necessarily something you can always find right away, but she was trying to pay it. By 2015, 2015, she had already paid $550 towards these tickets, but she wasn't deemed to have satisfied them because the penalties kept rolling over. You know, that's, that's how they get her. That's how they got her. She was arrested twice for two parking tickets. She spent six days in jail for two parking tickets. And by early 2016, by the time we came in and were resolving our consent decree and looked at all of these issues, the city was still telling her that she owed them over $540. From $152, to over $1,000 for two parking tickets, economic inequality, six days in jail. What if she'd lost her job? What if she'd lost her home for two parking tickets? 
And we, what we discovered was that Ferguson was not the only small municipality so dependent on these fees and fines that fall most heavily on the most economically vulnerable. And who carries out the enforcement of these fees and fines? The police. The police. And this means that law enforcement is the face of government for all purposes and the face of injustice also in ways that go beyond routine policing that affect your very quality of life, your very daily existence. What is it that America has failed to hear? What is it that America has failed to hear? America has failed to hear that the issue of police and community relations is inextricably linked to our country's failures. America has failed to hear that the mistrust of law enforcement is connected to a mistrust of government writ large. And this is indeed in large part because, as I mentioned, the police are often the only face of government that many people see. And they come to represent government's lack of regard for many of its citizens. But make no mistake about it, law enforcement also brings this mistrust upon itself when it engages in unconstitutional and abusive police practices and then seeks to avoid accountability for its actions, the accountability that ordinary citizens are subject to every single day. And that further exacerbates the larger issue of government mistrust because citizens feel like not just that there's a different set of rules for law enforcement, but they feel something worse. They feel like their government is not there to protect them. That when they are in trouble, when it is the middle of the night, when they are threatened, when they are in harm's way, there is no one for them to call. That is the loneliest feeling in America, and it should not devolve on any of our citizens. Now, of course, these issues are not new, nor are these incidents. By the time that I came to the Attorney General's chair in 2015, I'd been working on these issues since the late 1990s when I served as a federal prosecutor in Brooklyn. And when I was a federal prosecutor, I was privileged to help prosecute the Abner Louima case in federal court there. Those of you who spent time in New York, this will be a familiar name for you. Many of you may not know his story. But Abner Louima was a Haitian immigrant who was arrested by the NYPD in the summer of 1997. Yes, a time when many of you may not have been born. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Louima was arrested outside of a nightclub on a hot summer night because police officers thought that he had hit a cop and laid him out. He was taken into custody. He was beaten in the back of the patrol car on the way to the precinct. Once he got to the precinct, his ordeal was not over because he wasn't taken to a holding cell as per procedure, but he was taken to the precinct bathroom where one cop held him down as another literally sodomized him with a broken broomstick, causing massive internal injuries. He was threatened with death to him and his family if he ever told a soul. But the severity of his injuries led to him being hospitalized and ultimately the truth came out. This is hard to hear. It was hard to sit through and listen to in those days. And one of the lesser known tragedies of the case, aside from the horrific injuries inflicted upon Mr. Loima by those sworn to protect and to serve, aside from the cover-up perpetuated by those officers and their supervisors, aside from the unrest that it plunged the city of New York into, one of the lesser known tragedies of this case was the fact that the police actually had the wrong man. Now someone had indeed struck that police officer. Someone had indeed knocked him down, knocked him out for a few minutes. It just wasn't Mr. Louima. It was in fact a relative of his so there was a resemblance. They were dressed similarly, but he, Abner Louima had done nothing, nothing, to incite the wrath and retribution that he received and that no one in any event deserved. 
Now, the investigation that we undertook in the late 1990s focused not just on this horrific violation of Mr. Luima's body and his constitutional rights, but also on the NYPD culture that allowed it to happen. We opened a parallel pattern and practice investigation into, into the NYPD because the question that kept coming up, why did uniformed police officers feel that they could cast aside their role as protectors so cavalierly and in the very heart of the place, in the very heart of a police precinct that is supposed to symbolize the motto to protect and to serve, why did they feel so free to take those actions? That does not come from nowhere. It does not come to you to do this all of a sudden on a hot summer night. And what was the structure and the culture of dealing with excessive force issues that led them to even consider, much less know, that their supervisors, their supervisors would help them with the cover-up. Now our investigation presaged so many things we saw in later cases, up to and including Baltimore. The NYPD's excessive force policy, ambiguous, poorly taught, no one had a clue. Little to no accountability for excessive force allegations or even the appetite to fully investigate them. No technology in place to even track a, a complaint if someone were to able to make their way through the thicket of red tape to put one together. And no system to identify and weed out the bad actors. The list went on and on. Now after reaching convictions in the criminal case, we negotiated with New York City for several months on the pattern and practice investigation. Our hope was to institute systemic change that would improve both the community's view of the department and the department itself. Our hope was to leave the NYPD better and stronger for this awful incident. I spent months with Rudy Giuliani and his team. <laughs> He has not changed. <laughs> now, I wish that I could tell you that we prevailed. I wish that I had a success story on this part of the investigation for you. But the reality is, we were not able to reach a resolution with the city. The presidential election of the year 2000 placed the Department of Justice into different hands before we could reach agreement. And it was a great disappointment that I saw that opportunity evaporate. But even then, I saw the urgency of the issues, as well as their larger connection to the issues of race and policing in our society. And I continued to hold out hope that we could, in fact, do better. Now, you may ask, what would give one optimism after handling a case like that? What would give you hope for the future after seeing such failures of responsibility and accountability? It was of other things that I saw. I saw something else that gave me optimism on these larger issues. I spent a lot of time talking to community members, not just as witnesses, but going out and hearing what they had to say, not just about how they interacted with the police, but what they wanted from the police. And I saw and I heard in the minority community of New York City, a place with no shortage of strong opinions, I heard a real hunger for a positive relationship with law enforcement. And where I saw connections that had been made on a human level, I saw them last for years. And even when the city was reeling from the Luima case in the aftermath, I remember being at a promotion ceremony at City Hall for a high-ranking police officer, an Italian-American officer. He was getting a wonderful leadership position in the department. And the most vocal group of supporters he had were the African-American residents from his first beat area, when he was first a beat cop on the street. He, they'd also been his last command area, but he knew them all. He knew them all. He knew their families. He knew their children. They knew him. They knew his kids. I saw the mutual respect and the true affection that he engendered, not because he commanded it, but because he earned it. I saw that. And when that connection is there, when we have effective policing, then we have 
mutual trust and respect. And then some of the most vulnerable members of our society can feel safe, can feel protected, as opposed to randomly and universally targeted. They will then have what so many people in our society take for granted, the knowledge that when they are in harm's way, there is someone they can call. Now, when I returned to the department in 2010, I was pleased to see the pattern and practice program had actually expanded. And a large part of it was something that we called collaborative reform. Police departments could and did reach out to the Department of Justice and request a review of problems and concerns that they had. And the requests for collaborative reform only increased over the years of the Obama administration. As police departments said, I don't want to go where Ferguson went. I don't want to wind up where Baltimore is. I want someone to come in and look at my excessive force policy now. Let me get this right before someone loses their life, before my officers are in danger. They could get a thorough review of their department. They could get an objective assessment of their issues. They would get technical assistance from law enforcement experts. Now, these were still hard issues, and they are still hard issues. They're not resolved quickly. They're not resolved easily. But when you have buy-in from both the community and law enforcement, you can make great strides. Baltimore had been involved in collaborative reform before Freddie Gray's death. That death showed us more was needed. And so we opened our pattern and practice investigation. And just as I opened my tenure as Attorney General with a visit to Baltimore, I concluded it with a visit in January of 2017 to announce the consent decree that is in place now, that is being implemented now as we speak in this great city. Now in looking at Baltimore and looking at Ferguson, what I did was I looked back to my time in New York, where I wondered were those bright spots that I'd seen, if any, in the relationship. Having seen the hunger for it, where were the guardians, where were the protectors? How had other communities dealt with these same problems and did they have any lessons for other communities facing this pain, because it certainly seemed as if almost every month we had another viral video of a police shooting involving an African-American man. And having spoken to the families of so many of those victims, I can tell you that for those children, there is nothing worse than watching your parent lose their life in front of you over and over again. As hard as it is for us to watch, as it, is, it, is, it rends them, it tears them, it harms them. And that's something that we all have to live with. So certainly to say that mistrust was high would be an understatement. Where would we start? What could we look at? We had a choice to make. And it's the choice that all of us face when we're looking at a difficult problem. We could believe that angry people could never come together and agree on anything. Or we could believe that people of goodwill and strong commitment could find common ground even on the most difficult issue facing this country. And we chose to believe that could be done. We chose to believe in the people of this great country. My team and I decided to embark upon a community policing tour. And we chose six cities that had experienced a very challenged police and community relationship. It had a police shooting of an unarmed man, or even a pattern and practice lawsuit filed against them, which the department had won. And we chose these cities, Birmingham, Alabama, Cincinnati, Ohio, East Haven, Connecticut, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Richmond, California, and Seattle, Washington, because they had been where Baltimore and Ferguson were, and they had come out on the other side of those conflicts with a real connection between law enforcement and the community. And we wanted to highlight the places that were making both a change and a difference so that other jurisdictions could see what could be achieved. And I have to tell you, what we found was so inspiring in so many ways. It went beyond what I thought could be done. And these cities had suffered. Yes, they had suffered just like Baltimore did, but they did not let that define them. Ordinary people, community residents, 
not used to speaking out in meetings, not used to addressing the mayor, not used to speaking truth to power. They sat down and they decided to save their communities. And this required both law enforcement and community members to admit where they'd fallen short. It involved painful venting, active listening, hard, hard work. Community members had to truly see the people behind the uniform. And law enforcement had to see and learn the differences between those who threaten the community and those who want to save the community. And they had to recognize the real pain that is inflicted when they lump everyone together. And both sides had to commit to real change. And I'm not saying that these cities became perfect, but they created a bridge to communication and a way to talk about the hard issues of keeping people safe, and they did it as a team. When I went to East Haven, Connecticut, the minority business community there had been terrified of the police. After the consent decree, they were welcoming them into their stores and businesses with open arms. But more to the point, I heard police officers who fought this tooth and nail. This will not surprise anybody who's been following the consent decree in Baltimore or any of our cities. Fought it tooth and nail. I heard them talk about getting to know the community again, working in partnership with them again. And one officer said to me, I resented everything about this consent decree. I thought you forced it down my throat. But after I went through all the exercises and sat down and talked to all the people and learned how my very presence is not what I think it is, protection, but they view it as a threat, I had to see it through other eyes. And he said to me, you know what? It took me back to why I became a cop in the first place. It took me back to why I want to protect people in the first place. And they were grateful for the very consent decree they had hated. In a, in a third grade classroom in a troubled school in Cincinnati, I saw uniformed police officers acting not just as security guards or running the magnetometer, but in a third grade class teaching reading. In third grade is where you have to catch kids when it comes to reading in the first place. So we talk about intersectionality, there's another issue there as well. And building your relationship with the community, with law enforcement, you have to see them outside the context of grabbing you up and snatching you up. They're in the classroom teaching third graders how to read. And I saw children connecting there as well. And when I was in Pittsburgh, one young high school student spoke up and he said, you know, I live in a rough neighborhood and I will tell you, sometimes I am afraid walking home from school. He's trying to avoid the gangs, trying to stay away from that. That is not easy. And then when he said, I'm also afraid to call the police though. And he said, I feel like there's no one there for me. The police chief is listening to this. I saw him literally hang his head in shame and say, I hear you, now I see. Now I see, we have to do better. And I didn't see perfect places because they don't exist. But what I did see were committed community members, dedicated law enforcement officers, who chose to truly see and hear each other and who made great strides. Now, I'm not here to tell you that we solved this problem of police and community relations. We did not, nor has it gone away despite not dominating the headlines. Our goal was to highlight the possibilities, to show struggling cities what could be accomplished, and to also show communities that they held in their own hands the power to make it happen. And we did achieve that, and we shared best practices across the country. Three main themes emerged from what I saw of a successful connection. First, both sides must truly listen. And that means not listening to, to prepare to respond, but listening to truly hear, to hear the pain that people feel in these situations. They have to accept their responsibility for negative interactions and negative perceptions. You have to own that. The second thing that we saw that must occur, police leadership must commit to true community policing. And they have to make substantive and visible changes to policy and practice or nobody will believe in it. It's one thing to say, well, my intent is this, but when your actions say something else, that's what will rule the day. 
And finally, there has to be an enforcement mechanism for accountability. There has to be a backstop, because this is hard, and people don't always get it right. And there is still tension between law enforcement and particularly the minority community. And that will exist as long as there is policing, probably. And there will be incidents. Now, in many of our cases, that backstop was our own Department of Justice consent decree, or the possibility of further DOJ intervention. Now, of course, we're in different times now. <laughs> Very different times. Our pre-existing consent decrees do live on. And I am hopeful that communities, law enforcement, and courts alike will continue to press for their full execution. And the community voice is vital here in this regard. People must stay involved. You must hold your leader's feet to the fire on these issues. Now, a consent decree is not everything. It's not a panacea. It doesn't fix everything. It requires strong enforcement and stewardship. We are now in a space where the turn of the political wheel, which always does happen, has the Department of Justice abrogating its responsibilities in this very important area. Now, as you can imagine, I'm often asked my views on changes that I see and the new hands that are in place. I don't comment on specific leadership because that is the turn of our political wheel and it is now their department to run. But I do look at the policies coming out of this Department of Justice with a profound sense of disappointment. The department has turned away from its role in collaborative reform and turned it over to a consortium of law enforcement groups, including police unions. Now, well-meaning as they may be, it is hard to imagine the same level of objectivity and pressure being brought to bear in a difficult situation. And most recently, within the last week, we heard that the department considers consent decrees themselves to be a contributing factor to crime and something that prevents effective law enforcement rather than promotes it. Now let me be clear, nothing could be further from the truth, nothing. <laughs> consent decrees are not the cause of violence. Sadly, that lies within the human heart and we all know it. What is it that the department is failing to hear. They're failing to hear that consent decrees address manifestations of decades old patterns of abuse and neglect. What is it that this Department of Justice is failing to hear? They're failing to recognize that police officers are increasingly forced to deal with social issues and mental health issues beyond just the enforcement of a statute, and that they need and deserve the training to help them do so. What else is this Department of Justice failing to hear? They are failing to hear the ultimately optimistic view that communities and police can come together and provide a framework for doing so. And when they fail to hear that, it is to everyone's detriment, because the view, the belief, to propagate the view that police officers cannot be effective and keep us safe and comply with the Constitution at the same time is not just wrong, it's defeatist. Because we know they can do it. I've seen them do it. I've seen them come through the process stronger and more committed to serving the public than before. What is this Department of Justice failing to hear? They are missing an important opportunity to help law enforcement navigate all the issues that we ask them to handle. They are doing a disservice to them and the community, and those of us who live on these streets are going to regret it. We just are. And it's deeply troubling to those of us who work with and care about these issues. Now, I'm also often asked, how do I feel when I see these policies that I worked so hard for being dismantled? in what is clearly an effort to remove the legacy of anything with the name Obama on it. How do I feel when I see the efforts to silence those of us who worked for this past administration and still have a voice and still want to talk about these issues? And I will tell you, it is hard. It is. 
It's hard to watch actions taken that seek to roll back the legacy of an administration that sought to bring everyone's voices to the table. It is hard. What I often say, though, is that the lessons of history show us that a legacy is more than the cases that we won. It's more than the laws that we passed. It's more than the regulations that we wrote or the policies that we put in place, although those are important. The true legacy of this past administration lies in the people that were empowered, the voices that were lifted, and most importantly, in the voices that were heard. The true legacy of the past administration lies in everyone who realized the possibility of change. And we will never forget that. And I see that legacy living on in everyone who lifts their voices or takes a knee in peaceful protest. That's the legacy of the past eight years. And everyone who joins the political system as a new candidate or even better, a new voter. That's the legacy of the past administration. Everyone who is demanding that history reflect a full accounting of this country's struggles to live up to its founding ideals, that's the legacy. And it's in all of you. It's here at Morgan. It's here in Baltimore. It is a legacy that cannot and will not be erased. And it will carry us through these challenging times. And I know that these are challenging times. It's hard. It is hard. I know we carry with us a sense of impending doom every time we check our news feed. <laughs> because we know that, sadly, things can always get worse. There should just be a breaking news Chiron at the bottom of the screen. Something crazy happened in Washington today. People in Washington have just lost their mind. Let's just leave it up. Leave it up. And at times of challenge like this, it is only natural that we want to look to our leaders. We remember what it was like to have a president who not only looked like us, but looked at us. Didn't just talk to us, but listened to us and worked to make it better. It's natural to want to look to our leaders for that, and it hurts when we cannot. It does. It just does. We have to admit that. Because the leaders we have today have revealed themselves. We know the answers that they would give us, and we know that they are, in fact, part of the problem. So the challenge of the present day is for all of us. What are we prepared to do? How will we meet this challenge? And this is a challenge that we've met before and we can meet again. And it is wonderful to have a friend in the White House in the Department of Justice. And I was honored to serve as your Attorney General and to work for the greatest president that this country has ever seen. It was an honor. It was wonderful. But for most of our time in this great country, you know we've had neither. And we have still persevered. And we now see more clearly than ever the importance of participating in this democracy. I hope you see it. We see that our path forward has not always been straight. Progress has been slow, but it has come because we have made it come. And that's why I shared with you both our success and our failure in the late 1990s in New York. Because sometimes our task is to start the project so that somebody else can be inspired to get it over the finish line. We're not always the ones who are gonna complete every task. And if I can leave you with but one thought today, let it be this. Government is more than who the president is. Law enforcement is more than who the attorney general is. Justice Brandeis told us the most important political office in this country is that of the private citizen. That's you. That's me. That's all of us. Because we hold in our hands the power to effectuate change at every level. What is it that America has failed to hear? Our voices. Let us raise them and keep them up. What is it that America has failed to hear? Our determination, our knowledge of our own worth. Don't ever sell yourselves short. What is it 
that America has failed to hear? Our power. Do not ever give it away. Morgan State, thank you so much for having me here, but thank you for working on these issues, for caring about these issues, and being the force that you are. Thank you so very much. Well, we have some challenging um, words from Attorney General Lynch. I'm going to invite people to come to the microphones on either side of the stage, and you'll have a chance to ask some questions. I, of course, will get the first crack. Is this my I think so. Oops. We did see so many possibilities during the Obama years. And as you said, it does seem that a primary objective of the current administration is to erase what we did see in the past, specifically in the area of criminal justice. What, to what extent are the initiatives that you all began fragile, vulnerable, um, possibly being totally ignored. And what is it that we need to do to assure that what you began is completed? Well, criminal justice reform was a very important mandate, not just for myself, but for former Attorney General Eric Holder. Um, one of the things we wanted to work on was trying to reduce the, um, the high mandatory minimums for narcotic offenses as well as to reduce the crack cocaine ratio in the sentencing guidelines. Historically, this has had devastating impact on the minority community. It's not to say that people shouldn't be held accountable, but the collateral consequences of that that we saw since I became a prosecutor in the 1990s showed those of us in criminal justice that, it, that these penalties were too harsh and that they were not effective. We were able to get some statutory change on the crack cocaine ratio, not where it should be, but lowered. Um, and when it came to things like mandatory minimums and using discretion to make sure that we, we sought the most appropriate charge for people as opposed to an automatic hammer on people, AG Holder set up a plan to give prosecutors great discretion in that regard. And the, and the administration began working on statutory change and reform to try and make it real and permanent. We actually had bipartisan support for sentencing reform, for spending money on re-entry programs, for example, as well as prevention programs, because everyone who has given thought to this issue on both sides of the aisle knows that we cannot incarcerate our way out of the problems that we have in this country, mm -hmm. that we have to prevent crime from happening, and that we have to look at the layers of inequality that lead to it. And I had many positive discussions with my Republican colleagues about this uh, on the Hill also. Unfortunately, we couldn't get statutory change. So consequently, those policies have been, prime, have been rolled back, quite frankly, by the current department leadership, who has a very different view of law and order. Uh, one that I think that in my view is, is, is stuck in the late 1980s, and unfortunately does not take advantage of all that we have learned since then. But the, the good news, and I know you may be thinking, where is good news in this? <laughs> A lot of the inspiration for the changes and reforms that we were making came from the states. Many states have been dealing with this from a budgetary issue. Criminal justice is a huge, um, uh, it takes up a huge amount of money to fund and to run and to maintain penal systems. And states were realizing, particularly cash strapped states were realizing that they took the same amount of money and invested it in prevention systems or diversion programs they could get a better outcome, they could rehabilitate people, and they could save money, and which was good for the public fisc. And this, frankly, to me, however you get to that goal is fine. Uh, and it led to pe people in places like Texas, 
which is a surprise to people often, my home state of North Carolina, began investing in prevention and diversion programs, particularly for low-level narcotics offenders, that have had a great deal of success, that are cost-effective, but also serve the benefit of either not saddling people with felony convictions, but also providing them a pathway back to a productive life. The states are great incubators in this regard. We have the opportunity, both in the electoral cycle and in our public life cycle, to contribute to this. Do not underestimate the power of state government to make significant changes when it comes to criminal justice reform and to be a leader so that when the political wheel turns back at the federal level, there will be support for federal change as well. The reality is most inmates are in state systems. Mm. Over two million people are in the state penal system, either incarcerated or under a parole issue as well. Whereas it's, it's, it's less, than, less than that, it's, it's, it's about, I think maybe 300,000 of the federal system. I don't, that number may not be right. So don't underestimate that and do not um, and, and do not forget to participate in discussion and debate and in elections that impact that issue. So to reinforce that, don't wait to vote for president every four years. Pay a lot of attention to local and state governmental yes. issues. Right? Um, I'll ask one more before I take questions from the audience. There's no one on this microphone, by the way. Um, we hear a lot these days about the rule of law being undermined. For people who are not in my classes and who don't know what that means, uh, can you say something about what is the rule of law and to what extent are we seeing it being jeopardized? Well, the rule of law is, is both the literal laws that we, that we honor every day as well as the concept that at heart no one is above the law that we all have to be held accountable for our actions, that we all have a responsibility to civic discourse and civic life to support um, law-abiding measures and law-abiding um, law uh, ways of, of conducting ourselves in a way that makes society run more smoothly. What we're seeing now, um, and I think frankly this, this is exemplified in the current administration, but it is a backlash that I've seen coming for some time, are people who act as if the law does not apply to them. Mm -hmm. um, they act as if it doesn't matter what they say or do. Um, not just in, in the context of a legal sense, as in you can't prosecute me for this or you're not going to investigate me for this, but even in the, in, in the context of civic discourse, I can say whatever I want to you. I can insult you, I can call, I can insult your heritage, I can call people from your country um, you know, rapists and thieves. I can call other countries other names that we all know of mm. with impunity because I am above the rules. Um, and so when you see that, I would hope, I, what I hope happens is that everyone realizes that no, this is not normal. This is not normal. And we all have a choice. We have a choice in how we live and how we operate, but also in the procedures that we set in place, the people that we send to public life what we expect from people already in public life to hold them accountable. Voting is an important way, but I think people sometimes often forget that we're constituents as well. We are constituents as well. Even if the person who won the election that's of importance to you is not the one that you chose, they took an oath to represent you. Let them know what you like and what you don't like. Let them know that you want them to uphold the rule of law. You want them to uphold the independence of the judiciary, for example. Let's put qualified judges in place. Mm. You want them to uphold the independence <laughs> of institutions like the Department of Justice and the FBI. Let them know that those are your views. Thank you for that. Um, we'll take a question on this side. And remember, everybody, short questions. To the point. Of course. We have a short question and answer period. Hello? Sorry, let me move this a little bit. Um, it's not the greatest view of you. Um, first of all, um, Honorable um, Loretta Lynch, first of all, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to uh, my home and our home. Uh, my name is Chinedu Wokafor. I'm an employee here at Morgan State and also a graduate student, uh, son of Dr. Cosmos Wokafor and Mrs. Uh, Catherine Wokafor. Um, I say that because uh, knowing where I come from uh, helps guide me to where I go. Um, 
I was a student, uh, as an undergraduate student, I was very involved in activism here on campus, um, not only due to our history, but due to uh, whatever God has placed within me. Um, during the Freddie Gray incident, uh, I was brought into a state of catatonia. Um, I was very unaware of how to respond to such a, a tragic incident so close to uh, my educational institution. Uh, myself and other students actually went down to the front lines um, standing in between the protesters and the police. And uh, we, we did whatever we thought we could to protect our great people of Baltimore. And even the next day, uh, we, we gathered with um, support of our administration to clean up the city after it was looted and destroyed. Um, but there comes a time where uh, I think of the quote of uh, Pope John Paul II, where he says, the essence of freedom isn't to do what you like but to do what is right. And my question for you is as it pertains to young students. Sometimes when incidents like Freddie Gray's death comes and, uh, or, or Michael Brown and we feel an emotional connection, there are some times that we feel like our government or our, our leadership isn't doing enough and that we have to take matters into our own hand in a peaceful manner at that. And I wanted to know your opinion on student involvement in such a, atrocities as the Freddie Gray's death. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it, it was a heart-wrenching time for all of us, um, you know, to see someone so young lose so much. Um, and I met with his family and just to see the pain that was there. And it is always going to be there. Um, so my, I will tell you quite frankly that, and I've said this many times as Attorney General, um, I support peaceful protests, not just for the death of Freddie Gray, but for, for issues of great importance in civic life. I think people have got to make their voices heard. We are, it is, it is a fundamental constitutional right of ours, not just to assemble, but to raise our voices and to be heard. And one of the problems that we found in Baltimore, um, as well as in Ferguson and other jurisdictions, was a widespread attempt to squash that First Amendment right, to assemble and to be heard and to express oneself. Um, and. And, and I know that sometimes people wonder, are protest marches still relevant? Are protests in, in general still relevant? I think everything that we do can serve a different purpose. I, it is very important that people in leadership positions understand the level of pain in a community when an event like the death of Mr. Gray occurs. It's very important that they see that young people, particularly students, are not only focused on that, but have connected with it in a way that is visceral and real and also leads them to protest. I have always found that when I've sat down and talked with students who've either been involved in protests or many students in, in, in this area are longtime activists, which is, which is a wonderful thing, they have some of the most thoughtful reviews of either, either policing issues or, or community issues um, that I've heard. Um, because they have an objective eye, they have a fresh eye, but it's very, very personal. And so I've always found it helpful to talk to students who were involved in either protest activity or just civic life in general. I will tell you that it is difficult when things turn to violence. No matter how easy that is, no matter how tempting it is, um, because of the pain that you're feeling, it makes it difficult for your voice to be heard. And it, makes, it, just, it just does. It doesn't mean that you'll be ignored anymore, but you then have to wade through the layers that people will impose on you, uh, as, which is what we also saw in Baltimore when people did turn to violence out of frustration and pain. That was clear. That was just clear. I mean, one of the things I remember King saying also about riots were that it is, it is an expression of liberation sometimes in people whose lives are just so confined. So it's, it's not as if people get up in the morning and say, I'm just gonna burn down my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, something occurs, to, to put it there. But I do think that turning to violence makes it difficult sometimes for the true message to get out. But I understand that, that sentiment and all. I would encourage people to find a way to be involved in community activities in the way that is most comfortable for you. Some people it's marching, some people it's writing, some people it is, it, it is um, working with other groups, strengthening community groups. There's a myriad of ways to get involved. Thank you. On this Thank side. You. Good evening. Um, my name is Gloria Cooper Blue. I'm 
an educator in Baltimore City and Baltimore County. I want to say first that we have a lot of things in common. We're both from North Carolina. Uh, we're both black women. We're both involved in the political system. And um, when you talked about the inequality and disproportionality in the housing sector mm -hmm. and with transportation, I see that going on in my city because um, our current governor stopped uh, a very important red line project that would have linked the west side of Baltimore city and county to where the resources are, in addition to the housing uh, difficulties that the city experiences because when we drive in certain neighborhoods like Park Heights, yeah. um, there's dilapidated housing, West Baltimore, East Baltimore, and then you go to other parts of the city and county and it's thriving. Um, what, I'm sorry, what um, would you, what advice would you give to a black woman who's seeking a position in government like um, Miss Stacey Abrams who's running in Georgia, um, the Black Girls Vote Project, and other women who are running for office. Could you give us some strategies and advice on that? Well, I'm not sure, I don't know if I can really do better than Stacey Abrams is doing, because I think she's doing a wonderful job. I, I, I commend that woman, first of all, for wanting to run yeah. uh, and, and going through the political fray. And she's been in politics for some time. But I think what, what Stacey Abrams shows us, just to use her as one example, and, and the host of other black women um, who are entering politics, is that you can enter politics and still keep your own voice. For years there have been, and, there, and these are wonderful organizations, they're organizations that will help female candidates become marketable or raise money, and those are very, very good because money is the oil. It's, it, it greases the skids of the political machine but they would encourage people to message in certain ways and, and essentially try and be palatable, right? To appeal to large, to, to mainstream voters. Mm -hmm. uh, and and in, in large part, this was because there was a perception and it was not always inaccurate that as supportive as the minority community is of minority candidates, we do not always turn out and vote. Mm -hmm. And so you ha you, you, they were helping people appeal to people that, who would come out and vote. Well, now I think that, that I see that paradigm shifting, finally, thankfully, um, with, with the voters that we saw in Alabama that sent Senator Doug Jones to the Senate, with the voters that we saw in Florida that now have uh, um, uh, Brother Gillum running yes. for governor, mm -hmm. as well as in Georgia. And, and what you see are candidates, you know, minority women, black women, uh, LGBTQ candidates, who are campaigning as their authentic selves and focusing on the issues. And so what I would say is find your issue, find your place, find your voice, um, and, and essentially use that voice to talk about the issues. Thank you, Sora, for your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pat um, Harris. Good evening. Um, my name is Natasha Pratt Harris. I'm associate professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Criminology, and Criminal Justice um, here at Morgan State University. I want to also thank you for uh, greeting us this evening. I had a lot of questions that I was going to send to you personally, but you answered almost all of the questions. Um, <laughs> I wanted to just comment and offer, ask one question. Uh, this semester, uh, several of us are working as a, <laughs> several is an understatement. There is a class that's happening right now at Morgan and Coppin State University, a joint class called Policing Inside Out. And much of what you said is happening. It meets on Tuesday evenings. We have a class of Morgan State students, Coppin State students, community members, and law enforcement professionals who are actually meeting together on our campuses. Last week, we were at the Police Training Center. It's a dynamic class. Knowing what we're doing, and we've um, partnered with the Chair of Criminal Justice at Coppin State, um, Dr. Roden Trader, and we were taught by the uh, Bahia Muhammad at Howard University who brought that program to Howard, um, knowing what we're doing, I know that in this room we have scores of people who are doing something to address criminal justice reform and to build police community relations. And I just want to take one moment to ask those who are doing something to address uh, criminal justice reform or building police community relations, just to raise your hand. You're doing something. There are a lot of us in the room who are doing some, some things that are um, not highly spoken, not acknowledged publicly, but we're doing something. Um, the question I have for you, considering some work many of us are also doing to address police training is, 
what are your thoughts about um, the push and the mandate that our law enforcement had was called implicit biased training. This is something that was lauded by former FBI director James Comey. Um, it was acknowledged as missing from what the Baltimore City Police officers were doing. It was a mandate by the feds. So this is something they weren't doing, but the, the question is the absence of explicit bias training. What are your thoughts about the absence of explicit bias training where at least the implicit is mandatory? Thank you. Well, it was, it was getting implicit bias training into the law enforcement curriculum is something that a number of us have been working on for a long time at the federal level. And, and, and certainly even before I was attorney general, many federal agencies had adopted it. Um, and the focus of it is not to exclude the issues of explicit bias, um, which, can, which can be more easily seen, but to deal with the situation where you have um, trained officers who are good at their jobs, who are well-intentioned, and who, because they don't exhibit sort of the, the explicit biases that tend, people tend to think uh, are, prob are the only problem that we see, are missing the point. Um, they, they don't understand that how they present themselves to the community is a problem when they presume that everyone in the community is some, has some kind of pathology. You know, they, they don't see that as a problem. Now, a lot of that is, is sometimes when, you know, if all you have uh, is a hammer, everything you see in the world is a nail. There, that's, a, that's, a, that's a part of police life also, unfortunately. You know, all doctors always see people who are sick and they assume they see illness in every face. Um, but the sort of implicit bias that also keeps uh, women and minorities from being promoted within the ranks of law enforcement is a problem. And so a number of us are, uh, were working on that issue for some time and have found it to be very helpful in expanding the view and the world view of law enforcement officers who often, as well-meaning as they may be, and, and these are not the officers that, that we see who were shooting people or who are, in fact, um, you know, literally abusing your rights so egregiously. These are the everyday interactions that people have that are layered with cultural misunderstanding and disrespect that doesn't advance anything. So I do see a place for implicit bias training. I think when it comes to explicit, you know, we tend to deal with that more as, as um, because you can provide sharper examples of it. You will see a consent degree, for example, that if, if the problem that you may have seen in a community is how a police department deals with allegations of sexual assault. You will see direct requirements for training on how to handle sexual assault and domestic violence victims. You will see specific uh, findings that you need to have specific training in how to deal with the LGBTQ community, a huge problem for law enforcement. Um, so we tend to deal with the overt issues directly, um, but implicit bias sort of runs throughout the perceptions that many of us have in life, and particularly when they get baked into policing, um, it can be difficult to even start the conversation. So I've actually found it very positive and very helpful. Thank you. At what point um, in your growing up or in your educational life did you decide that going the prosecutorial route or, or working through law enforcement was a way to accomplish your goals towards uh, justice reform? Well, for me, I, you know, enjoyed, I was one of those people who enjoyed law school and enjoyed the practice of law, but I, I left law school and went to a large firm in Manhattan uh, because I wanted to learn a lot and I wanted to be exposed to a lot, but I also had loans to pay back. Uh, that was just a reality we of it. We know about that. And that's, that's a reality of life. And so you want to make sure that you not only learn your craft, whatever that craft is, but um, you know, handle your business in a way that will let you go on uh, and, and be able to do the things you want to do in life. And when I began trying to think about what I wanted to do after my law firm life, talking with different people, when I talked to people who were prosecutors, I very much liked the idea of protecting people, of protecting the community. Um, I also thought, have, have always thought it was important that those of us who don't have the most obvious connection to law enforcement need to think about it um, because we're the voices that are most needed. We are absolutely the voices that I've learned so much from the black police officers and agents that I worked with, uh, both about the things that they had to endure coming up in their departments and on the street, 
how they navigated those issues, why it was so important for them to be there, to be the person, to be the face that a defendant might see, to be the face that a family might see in the midst of a crisis involving the criminal justice system intersecting with family life. Um, so for me, it, it's always been a way of continuing my desire to help protect my community. Good evening, Soar. My name is Roxanne Fuentes. I am an instructor here for the Masters of Social Work uh, program and also a native New Yorker. And I remember being beginning my graduate studies at Columbia when the Abner Louima case came about. Um, as an Afro-Latina, I have the sometimes misfortune of experiencing a lot of hurt and pain in both communities. Um, and I remember what it felt like going through that case. And unfortunately, all these years later, still experiencing similar feelings for all these other cases that have come about. My students in my classroom, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, <laughs> um, sometimes feel defeated and will often ask me, what do we do? Um, when you have all these cases that are so public now because of social media, yes. clearly, it's not that they just started. I think it's just mm -hmm. now we have a, a venue to uh, play it and display it so freely. When you have all these cases and you see all of these police officers repeatedly getting off for cases that clearly we don't get, have all the information, I'm sure all the legal le loopholes and somewhat, but it's just hard to believe that every single one of them were innocent. When my students say to me, what do we do now? To be honest with you, sometimes I'm lost for words. Um, what is your position? What are your feelings about all these very publicly visible cases of police officers clearly using excessive force um, and getting off? I think they're very hard to see. And mm -hmm. so I understand why your students can be, a little, can be somewhat traumatized by them, quite frankly. Um, because it's difficult to watch someone lose their life. We haven't had that before. Um, or to just, even just to be harmed by government you know, that's supposed to protect you is traumatizing. So we have to recognize that as trauma. But then I think we have to say, what can we do here? And the reality is, you know, one of the things that, that has happened as a result of these viral videos is not just that we see it more, but it's allowed us to have a conversation about it in ways that we didn't have in the 90s when I was doing the Louima case. I will tell you, it, it's, it's, I, I'm not gonna say take the long view and all that and ignore the, the present day, but it does give us a chance to see how far we have come. The fact that there are people who now see this, who are not in our community, who see this and now they understand what we've been talking about for generations. Um, and you can, and one thing that I tell young people is, I know it's hard for you to see and hear now when you look at it, but it's clear to you. Imagine describing it to someone 10, 20 years ago and having them say, I don't think it's that bad. Hmm. That didn't really happen. Oh, the police would never do that. Oh, that, that wouldn't be, you, you must be misunderstanding. You're misinterpreting. All the things that have been said for centuries when we raise issues and concerns about the trauma that people of color face in this country, be it at the hands of law enforcement or in other ways. So as painful as it is to look at those, they have in fact advanced the conversation in ways that many of us have been, have been struggling with for years. And that's a benefit to point out. It's hard to see that when you you know, weren't caught up in, in being dismissed before. Um, but it really was difficult to get people to understand what it felt like. And, and as you remember in New York City also, not only did we have the Louima case, we also had the lawsuit over stop and frisk. And getting people to understand the pain and suffering that being unnecessarily, unfairly, and illegally stopped and frisked mm -hmm. multiple times a day, a week, engenders in, in young people of color, usually young men of color, was almost impossible until people began to look at these videos and truly see the disparity in how people experience law enforcement in this country. And it's just, it, it is, it's, just it's there, it exists. Um, and so that's one thing to point out to them. The other thing that I always tell people is individual cases are hard. They actually are hard. The, the, the standard of proof is very high uh, the case law has been, has been written and interpreted in a way that, that as, a, as a former colleague of mine said, gives police officers the benefit of the doubt that every defendant is supposed to get in a criminal case. 
Um, and, and that's the structure. So as an individual case, yes, it's hard to see. So what I tell them is expand your view of what justice means. Mm -hmm. Expand your view of what, it, because it, it often doesn't mean winning the case. Um, sometimes it means raising the issue. Um, for me, it often meant looking at what led to the case. Because by the time the case got to my desk, someone had already lost their life. Mm -hmm. So how do I use what I learned from these cases to try and prevent that from happening when someone encounters this police department again? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, that, to me, is the tragedy of the current department's posture on consent decrees and, and, uh, and federal oversight. But we are seeing uh, state, some state attorneys general to step up to the plate and also conduct these same investigations and look at these issues also. Thank you. We're going to start wrapping up, I think, by let me take the two questions here. Okay. Uh, let me take both of the questions, please. OK, hello. My name is Jada Grant. I'm a freshman computer science major from Baltimore County, Maryland. First off, I want to thank you for speaking. Um, you were one of my very first role models, including Michelle Obama and my mom, <laughs> as a black woman achieving high success. Um, as I was in high school, I was able to obtain um, a computer aid internship at the National Security Agency, and that was one of my first work roles. Um, however, as soon as I stepped in, I realized I was the, um, one of two black women in the office. Um, knowing where you come from and you being the first African-American attorney general, what have you gained or what have you learned from, you know, sometimes being the only face in the room, being the only black person, or even the only black and only woman in the room? Um, what were you able to experience? And can you share that with me? Thank okay. you. Okay, let's take the, the other questions here and we'll have a kind of wrap up answer. Um, how you doing? My name is Nicole Hansen Mundell. I am, um, I work with the organization by the name of Out for Justice, and we represent individuals who have been directly impacted by the criminal justice system. And our primary goal is to advocate for laws and policies that impact individuals or criminal records who's actually been um, brutalized by Baltimore City Police Department. There's been a number of things happening around the city today. There's a gubernatorial debate happening. The Baltimore City um, delegation chair election, and I chose to bring my two daughters here to hear you, as opposed to hobnodging with the Democratic Party. <laughs> um, I just wanted just a little. I think most of the folks who asked the questions kind of like took my question. Um, so, as a woman who has had some interactions with the criminal justice system, has been incarcerated for incarcerated for up to a year, um, what is your advice to individuals like me who've reformed our lives, who choose to participate in the legislative process, um, who choose to work to reform a city that feels like things can never change? You know, what's your advice to us? Because I, I have to try to keep my members engaged and they go out every day and they still see officers um, breaking the law and treating people with disrespect. You know, what, whatever advice you have to offer that I can, some words of encouragement to them. So we have two questions related to your role as a woman in criminal justice, too. I, what I, well, first of all, thank you for working with this group and for keeping going after what you've been through. That's, that is such an inspiration to everyone. I would say that I, I'm, I'm sort of struck by what you're doing. You know, when you say you want to participate in civic life, it's, there's a whole lot of people who've never had any interaction with the criminal justice system who, who sort of sit back and don't do anything. Um, so thank you for participating in this. But it is difficult. It's difficult when you've had, when you, when you get tied to the criminal justice system to break out of either stereotypes or misunderstandings about what you can and can't do and what you should and shouldn't do. Um, so first of all, it has to come from inside of you. Don't let that stop you. I, I, I always tell everyone the best advice my mother ever gave me was when I was very young and you know, certain things you wanna do and you, know, you think you're, you're going along in school pretty well and you realize that, oh, this teacher is putting me in a different category because I'm the little black girl you know, over here. Um, and, um, and something had happened and it doesn't even matter what, but because it's something that happens to all of us where you sort of, you're going along and all of a sudden you are the only one. You know, you are, you are the only one there, and people are trying to put you in a box. And what she said to me is, people will look at you, and they will try and define you. 
They will try and tell you who you are and what you can and cannot do, and don't you ever let them. And my mother is a retired librarian, Baptist minister's wife, soft-spoken. She was angry that day. I forget what had happened. <laughs> she said, don't you ever let them. You know, there's, there's specific advice people give you. Like, I, what I will say is that when you're in, when you're in an interaction, when you're in a, the Democratic Party meeting, or you're at work, and you're the only black face there, the only female face there, the only black female face there, you know, if someone's got a problem with it, it's their problem. It really is. It really is. We internalize a lot of that, particularly as women. You know, there, there's a lot of sociological research that talks about how women over-apologize for things that are not our fault. We bump into someone, or they bump into us, and we say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, a lot of that is a way of smoothing social interaction, but, but the result of it is often it makes us smaller in the eyes of the world. And so I really do believe that um, despite Sheryl Sandberg you know, having a life of privilege and being doing very well, she's on to something when she says lean in. I always tell young women, speak up. Own your voice. You were there for a reason. You're at the NSA for a reason. You're work you've been placed with this group of women who are, who are returning home, who are making lives for themselves for a reason. And trust in that reason. Trust in yourself particularly for black women who have been through more than almost any other group in this country. That's a whole other speech, which we won't <laughs> get into. Um, but, but, but own your truth. And when you see a point, don't be afraid to speak up. And it can, sometimes it can be as literal as going into a meeting and practicing and saying, you know what? Today, I'm going to express these two views. I'm going to make sure my voice is heard on these two views. I've told young women sometimes, if you're, if you're shy, write it out, literally. And get used to it, because no one, if, no one can do it for you but you. But if, and if you don't project who you are, people will write your story for you. They absolutely will. So I would say that to both of you, please keep continuing what you're doing. In particular, we have to work for issues that allow people who have had a brush with the law whether it's incarceration or just some sort of, um, of probationary sentence, to also return to civic life. When I talk about local government, local laws, laws that, that determine whether or not someone can vote, laws that determine whether or not someone can hold a professional license, like a hairdressing license or a barber's license, laws that determine the kind of driver's license you can have, can have very limiting impact on the employment opportunities for individuals who are qualified, who want to work, and who will contribute to society if we, if we provide them that off-ramp back into, into life. So look at those local issues also, and pick one and work it to death. Thank you. And let's take this side of the room for our last questions. Hello, Honorable um, Loretta Lynch. My name is Faith Sewell. I am a junior, and I'm a multimedia journalism major. Okay, so I know you have accomplished so much in your career. Um, so out of all your, um, everything that you have learned throughout your career, what do you hope to continue, your legacy, your morals, um, to continue in the next Attorney General? I know you said that we're living in a different time right now, um, but what do you hope to continue, and who, what do you hope to be remembered by the most? Okay. And this next question here. Hi, good evening. My name is Akosua Lee. I'm a junior social work major. Um, I told my dad, who is a, pro a history professor in New York, he was so excited that you were coming to speak. And then um, he told me I better ask a question. So <laughs> <laughs> It's being recorded, so you can tell him to watch it. <laughs> so my question to you is, in your capacity as attorney, attorney general and that of your predecessor, who was um, Eric Holder, why weren't we, in your opinion, be able to bring down police violence against African Americans. We had a black president and two black attorney generals, but things got worse for us with law enforcement who were supposed to protect us. And what will you advise us moving forward? And I ask that because I have five brothers and they're obviously black. Um, <laughs> a year ago, a police car um, was like coming around, but clearly wasn't coming for us. And my brother automatically ducked down his head and I asked him, why did you do that? He was like, because he was scared that he might hurt, they might hurt him. And those, those in law enforcement that was supposed to help us 
why are children or others feeling like that was supposed to help us? Why are they feeling like they're supposed they're out to get us? So that's my question okay. to you. Mm -hmm. And that's related to your legacy. <laughs> no, it definitely is. It, it definitely is. As, as if I had, look, I, I think sometimes you you will have a view as to how you want to be remembered, but history will decide that for you. Um, so I don't um, have any any view that I can control that in, in any way. But I would say if I if I had to pick, I would like to be remembered as the Attorney General who took the Department of Justice outside of Washington and around this great country and met people who were sitting and working on exactly the hard issues that you were talking about there, and who sat and listened to them and took their advice back to Washington and tried to make things better. That's how I'd like to be remembered. Um, when it comes to, to the issues of law enforcement and community relations, the fears that you talk about, um, which many of our children have, and adults, by the way, um, you ask, why were things not better? Under the, under the Obama administration. It's hard to say whether they're better or worse in, in numbers. In many ways, I think they seemed worse because we heard more about it. And as, and as I said before, as difficult as it is to hear about it, I think we have to talk about it. We have to get it out there, and we have to acknowledge it as a real problem and a real issue, as opposed to just something that we've either made up or we, we are exaggerating. So that was a huge accomplishment. When we look at um, the things that, that we tried to do on the federal level, you know, we essentially try and lead by example and provide resources and guidance for the, um, the 18, I think it's 18,000 police departments in this country at every state, local, uh, municipal level, including universities and sheriffs. Um, they don't directly report to the Department of Justice, but we have a lot of interaction with them through grants, through support, the collaborative reform that I mentioned. A lot of it was leading by example. We, in addition to visiting the cities that I mentioned who had worked through problems, I also visited other cities that were working on the tenants that we developed from the 21st Century uh, Task Force on Policing that President Obama called for in 2014 that was putting together best practices for the police departments to deal with community relations, to deal with uh, the fears that people felt. Real, real solutions, practical solutions. We were trying to highlight departments that were working on that. The challenge is always, in government they say, getting it to scale. All that means is the challenge is having a great idea and spreading it out enough so that everyone can take advantage of it. That's always the challenge in government. Um, I think we made great progress in that. You know, even now when I talk to police officers and, and sheriffs that I meet as I travel today, they talk about things that they gained from working with the past administration, how they feel it's made their department stronger and better. There, there's a long way to go because it's a, it's a big problem. Um, I think it's something that everyone has to stay focused on, however. And as you see opportunities to participate in the discussion, you gotta take them. I met students who would work for a summer at a police department and get to know how police departments operate and work. That was a great way for police to understand how they come across to young teenagers sometimes, because they often don't see that. They don't see that. It was a way for, for teenagers to understand what was at the heart of why police did certain things, because it's not always inherently obvious. It's not something you can just sort of intuitively know why certain things are happening in policing. So we did a lot to build those connections and set those programs up. A lot of police departments took advantage of it. A lot of them are still working those programs and, and living that way. But there are a lot of agencies in the country, and it takes a long time for this to spread out. That's why, in my view, it is so important for the federal government to continue that role, that leadership role on a national level uh, is what's needed now. We don't have it, but I think we can still push for it in our own communities and our own states. Thank you very much. And as President Wilson comes forward to close us out, there were, I don't know if you picked up on two things here about Attorney General Lynch. She is a PK, a preacher's kid. How many of y'all are in the audience? <laughs> and um, someone said, Sarah, she's a Delta. How many of y'all in the audience? <laughs> All right. Now, thank you very much for this discussion.